Welcome, Megalithomaniacs. We're today we're talking with Andrew Collins, and myself, Hugh Newman, and JJ Ainsworth about something really interesting that myself and JJ witnessed on the winter solstice morning of December 2021 at Carahan Tepe. Now, as you know, Andrew and myself and JJ, we've been researching this for quite a long time. Andrew's been visiting Carahan Tepe since something like 2004. So he's been at the forefront of the research there. And we had this very, very interesting experience on December the 20th, 2021. And we witnessed about just under an hour after sunrise, this light phenomenon occurring at the site, which we're going to describe to you in detail. JJ will tell you a little bit about it. And part, one of the reasons we went there is because Andrew previously had discovered this summer solstice sunset alignment, which is virtually on the same alignment, but going in opposite directions, much like we find at Stonehenge, but we actually find it at Carahan Tepe. So it's really interesting. So we kind of looked into that and we visited there and something remarkable happened when we turned up there after about 50 minutes or so after the sunrise. And JJ witnessed it. I witnessed it. We photographed it. And we believe that something really spectacular has occurred that maybe people haven't seen for up to like nine or 10,000 years. So, JJ, do you want to describe what we saw before we go into the analysis? Oh, sure. We arrived to the site and, of course, it was a really cold morning, but it was we knew it would be special because of the day. So we arrived and climbed a little hill. And we looked around because it's, you know, I'd never been there before uh, for it being uncovered. And as I was standing there, I just started noticing a light come through the, the port, portal stone and it hit the side of the head. And that was an unbelievable moment that I witnessed. And I just thought, oh, my God, it, it, I knew that it was purposeful, that it wasn't accident or just something amazing. And I really think that the figure, the head with its long neck is maybe a, a feminine figure, but that's speculation right now. But what, whatever it is, whatever it is, it was amazing that day. And I'm so glad that we made it there. Um, it was, I'm, I'm really feeling happy about that and blessed and excited to hear um, information from Andrew as well. Uh, yes. Yeah, so what we witnessed so was, you know, as the light moved as over the next hour or so, we actually had this kind of light moved towards the front of this like protruding head inside what Andrew calls the pillar shrine, which is enclosure AB, I believe. And it kind of started illuminating more of the face and then the neck, which is like a serpentine neck. And then it completely went into darkness. And then a while later, as the sun rose above the portal, the top part of the head became illuminated. And we'll show you some images of this. We've written an article about it. Uh, we've done a video about the actual, you know, actually at the site as well. And so quite a lot. So we were, we've been debating, you know, would it have been like that, though, when Carahan Tepe was built, you know, many thousands of years ago? And this is where Andrew comes in. And we're going to introduce him in a second. But first off, we want to just mention the fact that we're going to be going to Carahan Tepe in September. September 2022 uh, from the 4th to the 16th of September we're doing a tour all around ancient Turkey because we're extremely excited about what we found there the fact that Karahan Tepe has now been excavated plus they're excavating more at Gebekli Tepe all the Karahan Tepe artifacts are now on display in Channel Earth Museum and there's so much more to see in that area there's more sites being uncovered uh, as Andrew's going to talk about so so we gave all this information to Andrew and him, him and Rodney Hale have been looking at it to see if actually this alignment is valid you know it may work today but did it work when Karahan Tepe was being constructed so so what did you come up with Andrew right well hi uh, Hugh and JJ um I took your information and I worked, as you say, with Rodney Hale, who's uh, been looking at, you know, astroarchaeology for, you know, for the last 25, 30 years, mostly with myself. And we think we've come up with something pretty exciting that I'd like to share with you in a few slides. So let's start. Um, now, there are three main enclosures that have been uncovered so far. Um, Structure AD, which is this, um, this elliptical shrine that you can see here. Now, that's got some incredible geometry, which I've talked about separately, but we won't go into that today. But it's linked 
via this porthole that's actually carved out of the rock with the second structure, which is structure AB, which I call the Pillars Shrine, because it contains in it these 11 pillars, which are carved out of the bedrock. One of them has been set into a pedestal, but the rest of them are all carved out of the bedrock and are set up in there. Now, as to what they represent, they could be ancestors, they could be the first gods, they could be something else, but there's definitely a link between the structure AD, the, the, the elliptical enclosure and the pillar shrine. And then there's a third shrine, which is structure AA, which I call the pit shrine, because there's a huge great pit in it. You can just see it on the top left here. Now, what Hugh and JJ discovered at the winter solstice on 2021 was the fact that the light of the sun, the first rays of the sun, not the first, but certainly after 50 minutes, would pass through the elliptical enclosure, go through the portal and hit the head there. Now we'll, come, we'll show some pictures of the head in a minute, but it would hit there. So this was happening in 2021 on the winter solstice, specifically the winter solstice. And of course, we know that there are many sites in the world that are aligned to very specific solstitial um, events, like for instance, Newgrange, obviously where the sun comes down a long chamber, a uh, long corridor into a chamber and illuminates certain uh, carvings within there, which is something that happens every year on the winter solstice and, and certainly has been going on since the construction of New Grace, it's 3000 BC. So, so is this the case at Karahan? Can this go all the way back to 9000 BC, which is the suggested time frame of construction of this incredible monument. Well, firstly, uh, Rodney Howe checked and double checked the actual alignment, the actual azimuth of the alignment of the sun coming in. And that's at 130 degrees. What I mean by that is that the sun is at 130 degrees in the sky and its light is coming through the, um, the, the elliptical chamber, through the porthole and hitting the head at that particular azimuth. So having found that out, having established that, we then move on to the skies of 9000 BC. And what we can see is that, and I'm going to read this out because this is brand new stuff. I want to get this correct. That as seen from Karahan at the winter solstice, 9000 BC, the sun rises at azimuth 122 degrees at 7.40 a.m. The sun would then have reached azimuth 130 degrees. Remember, this is the angle between the porthole and the stone head at 8.30, by which time it would have reached an altitude of 8 degrees, this occurring exactly 50 minutes after sunrise. So that's what's happening in 9000 BC, okay? But does this make the alignment that was seen by JJ and Hugh correct for this time period. Well, now we come forward to 2021. In other words, the year and the date that they actually went to Karahan and put in the same coordinates into the Stellarium, which was the, um, the sky program used. At Karahan in 2021, the sun on the winter solstice rises at azimuth 120 degrees. This being uh, at 7.38 local time, this is a full two degrees difference in azimuth from 9000 BC. This is due to what's known as the obliquity of the ecliptic, right? And that changes the position of the sunrise over a period of about 41,000 years. But we don't need to go into that at the moment. But all you need to know is that it, it, that it shifted the position that the sun rises further north um, from 9000 BC to 2021 in the common era. In other words, today. So at the winter solstice 2021, the sun reaches the azimuth 130 degrees. Again, this is the angle between the port toe and the stone edge at 842. So that would have been the time that JJ and who, who actually saw this, this being 60 minutes after sunrise. This today takes place at an altitude of 10 degrees. Thus the sun, when it reaches 130 degrees in 2021, is two degrees higher than it was 
on the same date in 9000 BC. Now, this is one of the pictures that, that JJ took of the phenomena as it came in. And here's, here's the other one. You can see the sun actually hitting the head. So what does this mean for this alignment? Well, as I've written here, so in 9000 BC, the sun's rays would have passed through the porthole at a slightly lower angle than they do today. That would have been two degrees lower. What this means is that provided no obstacles were in the way, more of the head would have been illuminated due to the better angle of entry of the sunlight. Wow. This would have made for an even more spectacular illumination of the head, which further validates the hypothesis that the alignment was deliberate. Oh, my God. Okay, that so I'll come amazing. on to that in a minute. Wow. So, you know, here it, here it is just coming through. You can just see it hitting the head. And then, obviously, we go through to this picture here, which actually shows the sun illuminating the head. So in 9000 BC, and we have to take that date at the moment, that pretty certainly is around the time that these monuments were constructed, the sun would have illuminated a large part of that head as it had gone through the, the, the porthole stone. And as I said, this is, this is no coincidence. I think this is a very, very important discovery and here's the interesting thing. I think if JJ and Hugh had not found this, by chance, of course, I think that it would have remained undiscovered for many years. And the reason for this is because it occurs, you know, 50 minutes or an hour after sunrise. So if any alignments were being looked for, they would have been looked for at sunrise on the winter solstice, not an hour or so later. So that's very, very important. And what it tells us, and I mean, we'll come on to this in a moment, but is that the Karahan builders very specifically had a knowledge of celestial alignments as much as they did the construction of these extraordinary monuments, which involve everything from stone buttresses to thrones to perfectly... Uh, geometrical uh, elliptical enclosures. So with this in mind, what else can we discover about these alignments? Well, one thing as Hugh has already mentioned is that prior to this time, what myself and engineer Rodney Howard had realized is that if you went on some kind of journey from the elliptical enclosure through the pillar shrine into the pit shrine and you came out of the pit shrine at the end of uh, you know of it almost like some kind of route or journey then the alignment of the pit shrine was directly towards sunset in 9000 bc and this is at an angle of approximately 301 degrees and the actual sunset, right, that's the, the actual line here. So the red line is a journey, if you like, from the elliptical enclosure through the pillar shrine, through the pit shrine, and then out through steps right at the end of it. And the actual alignment itself is at 301 degrees. And this is the Stellarium view of that. So that's the sun setting in 9000 BC at the time of the summer solstice. And it's within a degree. I mean, it's obviously impossible to get it dead accurate, but it's within a degree. So this alone suggests that we are dealing with some kind of calendar based upon the solstices, the sunset at the time of midsummer and the uh, sunrise at the time of the winter solstice. And this creates a calendrical system. Now, why would you want this? Why was this important? Well, we know obviously that the solstices represent the longest days of the year, that's the summer solstice, and the shortest day of the year, which is the winter solstice. But there's more to it than that because just two hours after the sun sets at the time of the summer solstice at 9000 BC, the Milky Way 
would have been seen at exactly the same spot, vertically climbing into the sky. And in other words, as soon as it got dark and you were looking at exactly the same spot where the sun had gone down, you would see the Milky Way. It's almost like the Milky Way would have been there waiting for you as almost like a road into the sky world, into the celestial realms. And in other words, the sky world via the Milky Way was being locked into the alignments at this site very specifically. And the only reason for this is obviously for journeying, shamanic practices going into the sky world and connecting with the celestial realms and the, the gods, spirits, whatever it was that they were communicating with. Um, and I, I, as again, none of this is coincidence. I'm sure of that. So let's just go back one now. So obviously what JJ and Hugh discovered was a line that goes all the way through the elliptical enclosure, through the porthole and hits the head. And almost on the same alignment, but just slightly obscured because of the timing, you have the summer solstice sunset, which you can see up here. And that hits, as we said, the sunset. So in other words, all of these three monuments are all part of this, this greater scheme of celestial alignments. And I think what this need, what, what it does is it tells us we've got to look further at sites like this, at Karahan, at Gebekli Tepe, for these type of alignments, whether they be of the sun, the stars, or indeed, of course, the moon. So as Hugh and Jojo said, obviously we are going to uh, Karahan in September. And I mean, I'm excited. I mean, this could be the first time that I'll have seen the, um, the new excavations. Um, I want to get back there. I mean, I've been there on a number of occasions, as Hugh said, going back all the way to 2004. Well, first of all, Andrew, the what you've you know the decoding you've done with you know looking at the alignment is is blown me away. Mm. I, I'm absolutely delighted. It's not just a coincidence. It's not just one of those things that, you know, maybe it's just happening now, not then, but it seems like it was even better back then. I'd, we should look into like getting a reconstruction of that kind of done, what it might look like. Mm -hmm. Because what's interesting to me as well, before we move on to the bone plaque, which is a whole other brilliant story, is it was like well after sunrise that the illumination of the head occurred. And also on the summer solstice sunset, you have, it's well after the sunset that that you know milky way going directly upwards occurs as well so it's almost like they're playing with time a little bit it's not it's not all just about as soon as the sun appears that's what it's all about there's like a whole kind of almost like a, a playing with it and they're kind of working with it through this whole kind of process it's almost like uh there's something else going on we haven't quite you know we don't quite understand regarding to what these ancients were thinking i mean it's just it's just pretty mind-blowing really mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, you know, I, I when I, I see these type of alignments, I think of the Inca, for instance. You know, they definitely aligned their monuments towards the solstices, um, but not just the solstices, the Milky Way in connection with the places where the sun rise, rose and set. And what happened was that eventually the Milky Way started to get askew of the actual solstices. And this was seen as a disconnection uh, with the, between the earth and the sky world. And it may well have been that something similar went on at Karahan, that, you know, there may eventually have been some kind of disconnection, you know, as time went on, maybe 8,500, 8,000 BC, or even later. And eventually this ended up with them having to abandon the site and finding somewhere new. So, I've, you know, I find this interesting. And although the Inca or the pre-Incas, of course, are much later in time, it's the same type of mindset. And I think that's important. And what I see at places like Karahan and at Gebekli Tepe, and I, 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 right from the first day that I ever went to Gebekli, which was in 2004, I just had this sense of, of a connection with the, the South American, Central American cultures 
Now, I, I don't think it's direct at all. I don't think that it means that people from one continent were in another, but it has the same feel, the same type of mindset. I mean, one of the first things people came out with when, when the, 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 the kind of pillar shrine was uncovered and that head was exposed, people were comparing it to the subterranean area at Tiwanaku because you have all the protruding heads there. I know it's kind of like yeah. speculative, you know, it's a completely different time frame. Although some people say Tiwanaku is 12,000 years old, but there's no proof of that, obviously. But, you know, there's like, and there's, there's other things like with the hands, like on the pillars touching the navel, you get that kind of thing there. So it's, it's, it's interesting speculation. It's, it's, mm-hmm. And even at Katimbo and Silistani, you had the 3D relief carvings as well, mm-hmm. which are identical, almost exactly the same. I mean, even Graham Hancock put them in his book, Magicians of the Gods, mind blown how similar they were. I've been talking about that for years. So also, JJ has been looking at the kind of, you know, the kind of symbology within that part of Karahan Tepe. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Well, the figure I mentioned that I think it is a feminine figure, although men were absolutely important. And I'm researching Gobekli Tepe too, but I think it goes along the same lines. And it has something to do with um, life, death, rebirth, regeneration, but not just that on many levels, like Andrew was saying, it has to do with um, the everything that's going on in the sky. Uh, we need to research it more, but definitely there is so much mystery. And Andrew's research has opened up a whole new area for me to dive into and not just one flat area of the, it has to do with the goddess. I'm, I think it's going to be so much more. And just unbelievable when we can finally understand a bit more about it because one of the one of the things as well uh, it, just, it just popped in my head that me and andrew i think met, had a quick chat about the other day was you got this kind of like uh portal stone next to the main enclosure which you get at gebekli tepe you've done work on that you know you've done the alignments deneb going through enclosure d and enclosure c and things like this i believe and like but at gebekli tepe What's behind that is not known because it's completely been built over, uh, you know, multiple layers, other enclosures, a great kind of, you know, tepe or hill behind it. So perhaps completely speculative this, maybe there's pillar shrine type things behind those like there is at Carahan Tepe, but I don't think we'll even know in our lifetime. I don't think they're going to be excavating that, unfortunately, but they could, I mean, the fact is they've got like what, at Gebekli Tepe, there's like what, at least 60 more enclosures, they think, that haven't even been properly uncovered yet just through the ground penetrating radar. So it's just so much more going on there. And obviously we have the Tas Tepela sites. We have like 11 other sites in the area or more potentially. Uh, we try to actually look at a couple. We, we, we try to go to Sefa Tepe. We try to go to a couple of others, but they've kind of um, covered them over. So you can't really actually kind of get to them, but hopefully by September we'll, we'll be able to see some of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, going back to what you said about the the portholes, I mean, this was something that I noticed many years ago at Gebekli, that there was this porthole stone at the rear of Enclosure D. And yet the strange thing was, is that none of the archaeologists seemed to be interested in it. They'd not even given it a number. I mean, every other stone had its number, you know, like Pillar 43 or Pillar 20, whatever, 22. And that one didn't have a number. And yet it clearly had carving on it and it clearly had this this hole, which was, um, I don't know, about nearly a foot in in diameter. And I thought, you know, this is a soul hole. You know, this is what in megalithic terms, what you find in dolmens, you know, various different parts of the world um, that was used for the entrance and exit of souls. And as far as Gobekli is concerned, I think that this would have been the soul either of the shaman falling into a trance and getting into a death trance. Because, I mean, the death trances that they would have had could have killed them. They were probably, you know, using very heavy um, hallucinogens, probably. I mean, maybe they, they got into an altered state through some other way. We're not totally sure. But, but anyway... They would have got into a death state, and that's the same type of state as when somebody dies and goes into the afterlife. The shaman's trying to do the same. They're trying to go into the afterlife, the place of the ancestors, the place of celestial beings or whatever. 
that's what I thought that pol- pol- that porthole stone. Yes, obviously we found that it aligned to the bright star Deneb in the constellation of Cygnus. But then, of course, we find that there's another similar porthole stone in enclosure C, in exactly the same spot in the north northwestern part of the enclosure. That one's broken in half, and we actually discovered that during one of our tours, if you remember rightly, because we were getting very excited about it and making everybody else very excited because we just didn't know it was there. It just We just noticed it. Um, that one does have a number. I can't remember what it was. It's something like 63 or something like that, pillar 63. I mean, don't quote me on that. But, um, but in other words, there were two. And then another one was found in enclosure B, almost again in exactly the same position. Then another one in enclosure H, which is in the northwestern part of the, uh, the you know, the, the Tepe itself, which they've been investigating over the last 10 years or so. And so all, you have these portholes always in the north, northwest. And that's exactly where it is at Corahan in the north, northwest. You have to see it from the perspective of the actual elliptical enclosure. So in other words, if you're at the south side of the elliptical enclosure and you look towards the porthole, it's essentially in the, 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 the north, northwest to northwest, an area. So it's the same area. This was obviously part of a regular, um, you know, system of creating these enclosures to have a porthole roughly in that direction. But what's so important about that porthole at Karahan is that if you can, as far as the geometry of that particular um, enclosure is concerned, that porthole, if you continue that line through the pillar shrine, it eventually hits the uh, the second hill at Karahan, which is called Kicheli Tepe, which is only about, you know, mile and a half away. I mean, it's quite close. You can walk to it in half an hour. And this is aligned perfectly also to the setting of the bright star Deneb in Cygnus as well. So we've not just got these beautiful solar alignments at Karahan, but we all, we've also got stellar alignments. And those stellar alignments match exactly what is going on at Gebekli Tepe. It's pretty mind blowing. There's so much going. I mean, there's so much more to be discovered. I mean, yeah, we mentioned these Tastepela sites, these which means stone hills. So basically, what's happened if people aren't aware that they've announced this at the end of September 2021 that they're going to be excavating a total of 12 sites. Obviously, Gebekli Tepe is still under investigation, as is Karahan Tepe, places like Sefer Tepe, you've got uh Bonkoklutala, which is further north past Mardin, um, Kortik Tepe, you've got um I think Anandia Hoyak, you've got uh, several others. There's been photographs, there's been documents, there's been tea pillars found at many of these sites. And it's just making making people realize that this is a major area of kind of discovery. I mean, our good friend Chuck, who ran this, who ran this brilliant YouTube channel, unfortunately died recently, claims that you know if you spread it out a bit further there's about 30 sites of this kind of age stretching as far as chattel hoya because there's another site we're going to visit on the tour in september but as andrew mentioned there's you know one of the things that uh, we did discover them actually one of our tours back in 2050 thanks to matt smith getting laser eye surgery i think might have helped was this bone plaque which andrew's written about we made videos about it it's only what like two or three inches long um, and it's got what appears to be two T pillars with a person standing in the middle and these deep peck marks at specific points in the sky. Now, Andrew will explain that to you briefly, but it's just the fact is one of our tour group members found that, kind of discovered that. And, and actually, we, we were taking photographs for it, not even realizing what was on it because it's so small. And now we went back there recently. Unfortunately, they've actually turned it over. Can you believe this? So you can't actually even see it. So we're going to have to talk to the museum about that and get them to turn it back over i don't know that's because um the discovery kind of frustrated them but um but regardless of that channel Earthy museum has now got an entire room dedicated to carahan tepe and we're gonna we'll put a few photos in here there's going to be more on display by the time we go there in september probably stuff that we've not even seen yet mm-hmm. so let's look forward to that but the fact is this this bone plug i mean maybe you could just tell us briefly about that andrew 
Yeah. I mean, obviously, as I said, a member of our group, the tour group, uh, actually found it. And I mean, this just shows you that, you know, if, if, if you come along on these tours, this is a road of discovery all the way along, really. I mean, anything can happen during them. But the Bow Platt is probably the most dramatic because, as I say, Matt Smith noticed that there were two T-pillars with a person between them, you know, nicely etched on it. He pointed it out to Hugh and myself, and Hugh, luckily, you know, had his camera ready and recorded our reaction and everything, and it's up online. Um, and the important thing about this, and I only recently realised this, is that the elliptical shrine at Karahan, the actual pedestals are holes in which the uh, the T pillars would have gone in the centre. There seem to suggest that the pillars would have been side on as opposed to edge on, like they are at Gebekli Tepe. Now, what what I mean by that is that if you enter into the enclosures at Gebekli, you only see like the, the front edges of the T pillars as you look up to them, the ones in the middle. You know, the huge great monoliths in the middle. But at Corahan, they are turned 90 degrees so that you see the side faces of them. Now, this is identical to what you have on that bone plaque. In other words, you look up and you see the sides of the T pillars and you can see the T actually above you, you know, looking down onto you, basically. And therefore, any arguments anybody had that the bone plaque shows T pillars in, a, in an unnatural you know, state, and you've never found it like that before, that's, that's, that's now out the window. We now know that there were T pillars that were side on as you enter into the actual enclosures. So, you know, this is more confirmation that the bone plaque is real. And unfortunately, the archaeologists, particularly the German archaeologists working, but Gobekli will not accept that that bone plaque shows T pillars. In their opinion, oh, it shows the foot of the feet of some animal, like a lizard or something like that. I mean, it's it's really stupid. I'm sorry, you know they they they've got to accept that amateurs like ourselves, and we are amateurs, can discover stuff like this, you know. And that story went viral. I mean, th there were hundreds of of you know, web pages about it. Um, and, I mean, it was an incredible discovery. And uh, that's the sort of stuff that can happen, basically, on these tours. I mean, it's, it's, I, mean it's, I can't believe they've turned it over. They've literally flipped it over. And we, I, was yeah, trying to zoom, uh, I was trying to zoom in and get... I was like, what? Hang on a sec. <laughs> it's the wrong way around. So well, have, at, least, have... at least we do have uh, some good photographs of it. So that's important. I mean, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna put a word. I, I will talk to some, some our friends in Sat Channel Earth to see if we can uh, do something about that because I think that's kind of strange um, the, that's been done. But I mean, at the museum there as well. I mean, we're gonna one of the the big sort of highlights of, of this trip we're doing in September is the museum. It's in, it's incredible. I mean, they've got a complete reconstruction. The Valley Chori, uh, they've actually moved it stone by stone. Now it's underneath the waters because of the Ataturk Dam and so forth, which is another pre-pottery Neolithic site, a bit later than Gebekli Tepe. Uh, even Klaus Schmidt was involved in that back in like the late seventies, early eighties and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's an you know, incredible place. Uh, so many, pieces on display there and so we do encourage if anyone's interested we just wanted to give you just a, a quick update of this Carahan Tepe discovery what's been going on there but also encourage you to join us uh, in September because this is like a unique trip we're not only going to be down in like you know the whole kind of southeast Turkey area we're going to be visiting Hattusa, um, Alajahoyak where they've got these giant polygonal walls much like we find in Peru Chattel Hoyak as well, obviously, near Konya, which is another very ancient site going back, so, you know, a few couple of thousand years after Gebekli Tepe, but that was discovered kind of first. Much of the iconography there we find also at Gebekli Tepe and, and, and many other sites. Um, Cappadocia be, as well, obviously. Uh, Cappadocia, yeah, obviously, yeah. With the, and Derenkuyu, the underground, um, the underground kind of 
uh, rooms that go on for multiple levels. You know, it's, it's incredible sights you find out there. It's, it's, in fact, it's just some of the yeah. most incredible There's places. One I've thing ever I, I want to say about Der- Darren Keogh uh, in its relationship to Cara Han. Now we know that the pre pottery and Neolithic culture had this incredible ability to carve rock. I mean, you know, create thrones, create buttresses, and whatever. We now realize that quite a lot of carved, um, you know, um, chambers and things like that that have been dated to much later periods could be even older. So like Darren Kigu, it's long been speculated that this parts of that underground city could go back to 10 to 12,000 years, maybe even more. And I think that now that now becomes even more likely. And that the Darren Kiyu people almost certainly are, are related in some way to the Karahan Gebekli culture. And near Darren Kiyu is another pre pottery and Neolithic site, quite extraordinary one. We visited it on our tours, and hopefully we can get back there this year. And that, of course, is a Shikli Hoyak, which is another extraordinary place. You know, it was a huge center for the manufacture of obsidian jewellery and artefacts um, and many other things have been found, including the first trepanned skull, I seem to recall as well, were found there. So we're dealing, you know, not just now with some little culture. And this was the thing with the discovery of Gebekli Tepe. Um, I think most archaeologists, particularly those working outside of Anatolia, just thought, oh, it's a one off. It, you know, this is an anomaly. Anomaly. OK, that whatever was going on at, at Gebekli Tepe was a one off. But we now know that that's not the case. As you said, there is 20, maybe 30 of these Taz Tepela sites in that go from central Anatolia right the way into eastern Anatolia. We are now dealing with a civilization of the ancients. There's no question about this at all. And this is an incredibly advanced culture that ends up being remembered as the Anunnaki of Sumerian and Babylonian tradition and the Watchers, the Nephilim of Hebrew tradition and probably the Immortals of um, Persian, Iranian tradition as well. All of which, obviously, I talked about many, many years ago in a book called From the Ashes of Angels, basically saying that I think that these are the memory of some kind of high culture that existed in southeast Turkey. And, you know, now we know that that was the case. Yeah, it's a pretty incredible place, that whole area. I mean, we, having just, uh, we did a huge road trip there just a few weeks ago when we were exploring, and that it's just it's just ridiculous how many sites there are, how many hypergeum-type caves. Even on the south coast, you have polygonal walls like you get at Elijah Ledger Hoyak. You get these giant castles. You get rock-cut tombs everywhere you go. And I just get a feeling there's like, you know, with, with what they're going to uncover. I mean, the f- just the fact that Gebekli Tepe has been barely touched. There's some, I mean, there could be like remarkable things like we're finding at Karahan Tepe, like hyper-GM type things just there. And so mm-hmm. it just amazes me how much work it takes to, and how long it takes just to uncover a couple of these enclosures because it's been so heavily covered over with thousands, hundreds of thousands of tons of rock and earth. It's just, uh, so hopefully there'll be more to see in September when we're all going to go there. So let's wait and see what happens there. So Andrew, so thanks for that, that analysis you've done that research on, on that alignment. We, we spotted a few weeks ago. Um, I'm absolutely blown away by that and just have the verification mm-hmm. that it's actually kind of valid at the time. Karahan Tepe was thought to have been built is even more mind blowing. And so we hope we can, you know, actually go back. I mean, it'd be very smart to go back there at different times of year, see what else is going on, because maybe there's more, maybe other things occur. Mm-hmm. Um, and thankfully that head's still protruding out of that rock. That could have easily got broken off if it wasn't carefully covered over, you know, things like just things like that. Other sites get completely kind of damaged and destroyed. So this covering over of the site is obviously a whole other mystery, but it protects them and enables future generations to appreciate them like, like we are now. So thanks, Andrew. Thanks, JJ. Right. Uh, and hopefully right. we'll, we'll see everybody in September. If yep. before. And, uh, yep. and, and of yeah. course, obviously, before that, you've got Megalithomania, where we're going to be talking about all this sort of stuff. 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's, that's happening. In May. What date is it? Yeah, 7th and 8th of May uh, in Glastonbury. We'll all be there doing lectures, a whole bunch of other amazing speakers. Uh, Professor Timothy Darville and, and many others are going to be looking at different aspects of the ancients, but we're all going to be focusing on, on this kind of stuff because there's some real revelations have occurred. So thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks, JJ. Thanks, Andrew. And we'll see you next time.